BuildOn is a nonprofit organization that is sponsored by local communities, local schools, and local businesses and companies. And their goal is to build schools in third world countries where education to them is scarcely given. For the last two years, I've been the faculty sponsor and I've worked with Miriam Javich, who is the mother of Sam Javich here at Thornton Donovan. And we've been working as a group to put together funds and also materials for a school in Nicaragua. Just this last October, we visited La Coya Terra, which is in the northwestern part of Nicaragua, a small village that has no running water or electricity, but it has about 12 houses, and the families are mostly related to one another. There uh, is a leader called Don Cristobal. We went with our Czech leader, her name is Melissa, she, um, and I think seven kids and four chaperones went with us. There was me, my mom, um, Sam Javich and his parents, Perry, Sage, Austin, Lindsay, and Kike. Miss Coffin also went, and the Trek coordinator, Melissa, went. And so we stayed in a little village in Nicaragua, a very, very rural area. Um, and so we each had a homestay family. I stood with the community leader and what he did was he started the community getting 33 acres from the government which he pays about 180 Cordobas for annually which to us is about seven American dollars and from there he brought his whole family and his story is kind of sad yet at the same time very inspiring. He was in the military during the big revolution that took place in Nicaragua between the Samosas and while in the military, his wife came to visit with their children, their three kids, and his wife was murdered in an ambush by contrabands. Yet, he stayed in the military for eight years, provided for his three kids that were all toddlers, and continued to form a community, bring all of his family there, and successfully reintegrate back into society. Around him, he has many of his children, and he's been married a couple of times, so he has quite a group of children, and they are in very actively involved in the community. So we were really working with his family members. To construct a school for a poverty-stricken community on the outskirts of Managua. We got there on a very rainy day. Um, the school that was there already was two pieces of tin with a hole in the middle and the water was pouring through. The first day that we were there they had planned an entire celebration for us but because of the rain it got cancelled so we all had to stay under what was their school until we built the new school. It was kind of like an awning and lots of the people from the village were there and clowns had come and we played with a pinata and danced with the little kids. The trip lasted for 10 days. Uh, we, were, uh, we flew into Managua and we um, traveled to the village the next day and then began to work the day after that. And we worked for five days and then uh, we went off to the coast. After we saw what their school was, which was um, just an awning, like I said, and they had a few desks and pieces of wood, we could tell that they definitely needed a place because you can't really learn very well when you're sitting outside and with distractions and stuff. They definitely needed a school. In the village, they need a lot of things. They have no medicine or any sort of doctor that comes to their village. There was no sense of the importance of clean water, um, of hand washing, of basic hygiene to keep people healthy. We were very eager to be of help and our whole purpose was to lay the foundation and create the um, structure, the infrastructure for the school. 
we basically brought all the materials. Uh, everything came through Build On. The only thing that the community provided, which they did extremely well, was labor. But other than that, everything came from Build On. Everything, all the wood, the materials, the cement, the rebar, uh, the tin, everything was provided by Build On to the community. Everybody's morning routine was a little bit funny waking up and seeing everybody in with their annoyed face on because the weather's so rainy and everybody couldn't sleep at night so we were all kind of half asleep the whole trip. I woke up really early in the morning, you know, every day they would wake up at the crack of dawn, we'd get up at 5. The women get up at 3 o'clock, 3 in the morning, to make the tortillas. So you start hearing the sound of pounding at 3 a.m. The mama in our house uh, woke up in the dark at around 4 a.m and uh, with the flashlight she put under her shoulder, um, chopped wood in the kitchen to make a small fire and to cook tortillas. Um, she usually had made the rice and beans the night before. Every single day we would grab our water bottles and we'd go outside. There would be like a light rain every night and we'd brush our teeth and then we'd have breakfast with our host family. All this happened in the dark. There was um, no light till about six o'clock in the morning. After that, um, me and my roommate Austin, we would have breakfast, mainly rice and beans. And then as soon as that was over, we'd go to the work site to help build the school. We worked alongside with uh, the villagers four hours a day, so we all spoke Spanish. It usually either consisted of tying rebar and making um, the support beams for the school. And I spent the most of the time working on the school helping to tie rebar. I think I became the queen of rebar. Or digging the foundation. We first started out digging trenches to that we were going to fill with cement to put these wire poles in to make the school foundation. So we had to dig the foundation and that was really hard because the dirt was hard to dig. Mixing cement, pouring gravel um, or painting. I, we did a lot of painting because nobody wanted to get their clothes dirty. The hardest part of the construction was probably that it was so hot every day. In the heat of Nicaragua where it was like 100 degrees every morning it was probably 10 times harder and there was no shade really and what amazed me is that they would just work like on and on and on and on and we would like tire out after 10 minutes. And we built the school for five hours and then we'd have lunch. Which is always delicious every day. It was always something new and we always had like some kind of really good fruit juice or something. And after lunch we'd do activities with the children or we'd take a shower. I was mainly with a, a young couple and a baby but I know that the students um, spent, they were actually in Cristobal's village. So they played endlessly with the, with the young children. We'd usually play volleyball or soccer or we'd play attack stage, which was, you know, still fun. In the village, they would call me Pepe. So I had a little brother, his name was Gustavo. Um, we became so attached that they started calling him Pepito, which means little Pepe. And we, he would go, he would be, right next to me wherever I was and he was just a blast to have. And then we'd do cultural activities. One day we made cookies, another day we went on a hike. We went to go see one one person's cornfields. One day we milked the cow and one day we went to their rice fields. Then after we would have the free time we would go back home for dinner and stay with the uh, host family. And for dinner, we would have rice and beans again. Some of the men would go out and they'd be playing a game of baseball, unless it was raining and the wives would be making food. In the evening, we would light candles after dinner because it'd get dark very early. And we would maybe play a board game with their family. We usually play games like Jenga or checkers or things like that because it doesn't really, the language barrier isn't as noticeable and it's kind of like, it's, it's easy to explain. After that, maybe we'd visit one of the neighboring houses or we'd go to the chief's house and he had the only light in about like two miles in the area. So it'd be one light bulb and we might dance or listen to the radio. He had a very, very small TV. So we might watch a novella, just stuff like that. Since in 
the village they didn't have electricity we had to go to bed pretty early so they usually went to bed around 7.30 or 8 because when it got dark there they had no light um, but they our family may put candles out for us and we all had flashlights so we went to bed around 7.30 a couple nights we went to bed at like 8 and one night we went to bed at 9 and usually at night we, we would go to bed early because there was you know we were first of all exhausted from working all day but it's also because the, it just it gets dark really early so you know it's it kind of your natural instincts kind of kick in and you just start feeling sleepy. Deborah McKellen and I stayed with the same family the same couple and we were able to kind of help them uh, in the kitchen well it wasn't much of a kitchen it was really just a fireplace um, and a table to pound the tortillas and so we learned how to do that and we learned how to keep the floors clean and uh, you know just and to go get the water you had to trek to the well which was quite muddy because of the rain each afternoon and into the evening so we had to take a, a big bucket which of course Kaylin our host mother was quite adept at carrying and get the water and bring it back so they use that for cooking they use that for washing and also for you know, just uh, clean up around the house as well. well. The group that's going to be attending the Build On School is mostly primary or kindergarten age children. But he also has other children in the village that are very eager to get an education. So once, um, actually the school is completed now, it's going to have two rooms for the younger children and the other room is going to be for the older children. And they're going to be able to bring in two teachers. So Marlon can concentrate on a curriculum that, that is more gauged to the younger group and someone else can, can actually engage the older children. We brought a lot of supplies because there weren't many school supplies. So we had um, binders and loose leaf paper and pencils and um, markers and you know everything we thought they might need to get them going in the classroom and to get them engaged. We brought tin whistles there for them to practice with, to play with during their free time I guess. Because Thornton Donovan is very fond of music and Sam Javich is um, a pianist. His family brought um, penny whistles for the students which they immediately began to play. I lived with the villagers and I also brought um, tin whistles to the children and I taught them to play you know basic scales and to try and bring you know some music into their village. The other thing that we worked on prior to our visit was a, a series of um, books that the students made themselves. Um, they were about various topics. They might have been about animals um, from around the world, or colors, or numbers, and all of the books were in Spanish, and they were very well received. We're making books about hygiene and how to keep yourself clean, and we're sending this to La Coyotera, Nicaragua. You know, we're putting a slideshow together um, about our time in Nicaragua when we went to go build a school. Grace, uh, how was your experience uh, in Nicaragua? It was interesting because no, we had never lived like that before. Other thing that I got involved in besides cooking and learning how to make tortillas was washing. <laughs> washing your own clothes. This was quite... Um, uh, I actually enjoyed it. What we got to do was, um, you know, we had to get that well water that I described. Then we w had this like stone. It reminded me of kind of a stone altar. And it was rough on the surface. And there was a little bit of soap next, bo next to or sitting really on the altar. So you got the well water in the bucket and you put your clothes and you put some soap on it and then you rub it against the, the stone, the rough surface, to clean your clothes. Well, I think the most interesting part, besides getting up every morning at 5 o'clock to cows and roosters calling every hour, was being able to interact with different people and not have to worry about a language barrier. Even though they spoke Spanish and we primarily spoke English, we somehow communicated and got our point across. I'm not that great at Spanish, but I learned a lot from them because they definitely were very patient with us. I would not have been that patient with people who didn't, I don't know, I'm not as patient as they were. They repeated things for us and spoke slowly and spoke simply so that we could understand them. And we had good conversations with our families and people there. 
it's amazing how people that aren't really as fortunate, they're so kind to us and they were so generous and so loving and they really invited us into their into their community, into their family, and they made us one of their family. Out in La Coyotera, Nicaragua, there's such a simplified way of life that you don't really have to stress the little things out there. It's just very relaxed and simplified, but when you get back to New York, of course, it's upbeat and very active and when you go to Nicaragua it's just you get to relax a little bit you get to appreciate life more but I do have to mention what surprised a lot of us is they have cell phones okay they do have cell phones which um, they are able to charge when they go to the closest town because the closest town does have or village it's more of a village it has electricity so they charge them but they don't have any fancy games or or even can take pictures with them because that would drain the battery too much. So they're very, they're pretty much for communication. And this was so surprising that I had to find out, well, why does everyone have cell phones? And basically it would be way too expensive for the government to build the phone lines. So this is a very inexpensive way. You just build a few towers and then people can communicate with one another. The village is self-sustaining in that they grow all their own corn and uh, beans and peanuts and rice locally, like in, within the area. In our family, the, the um, men grew enough corn and beans to sell to other members of the community and they stored the corn in a big uh, vat outside the door of the house um, and, and that's really all they ate. They didn't eat any vegetables, they didn't eat any fruits, um, occasionally an egg from a chicken that was running around. What amazed me was that after they worked all day and they were all tired and exhausted, you'd think they'd all go home and just pass out every day, but all the men would go home and get their gloves and their bats and they'd all run out into the field, all excited to play and they'd play three hours and the whole village would show up and it would be like they're, they're all standing there cheering and playing this game of baseball and it's like, how do they have the energy for this at the end of such a hard day? We stayed in the village for about I want to say seven days. Um, I I learned a lot from this trip. Um, I learned not to take things for granted, not to take things that we have in America, like running water or having pets treat our pets with affection, because they did not treat their pets with affection. They were more of a thing that was a necessity. They had to have them. In many ways, this trip brought me a lot. Uh, it kind of showed the hospitality that pe can be given by such a generous group of people who literally have nothing but give so much love and uh, respect and just hospitality that you feel almost as if you were a member of the community yourself. I think I learned that I shouldn't take for granted anything that I have because whatever I have is a lot more than a lot of people do. I may not have a car or a big house, but at least I have a family that loves for me loves me the way they do and I have all the things that I could possibly ask for. I learned how lucky I am, you know, to live where I live and to have what I have to, um, you know, to be who I am and that I can help people like this, that I was given the opportunity to, you know, experience something like this, make new friends and to help them. I learned to appreciate what I have and to be more aware of others around me and that not everybody has what I have and that it's important to give back in any way that you can. And I thought that the people in Nicaragua just open their, open their homes to us even though they didn't have a lot. And I can give so much more in my own way. It's really important to remember to be thankful for what you have and to respect what you have and to think about, you know, those that don't have what you have and to try and figure out how to help them, you know, to, um, to give back some of what you have, I guess. I didn't think that there were that many people in this world who still live without electricity and water and they seemed completely happy with it and they didn't mind that they didn't have a lot of money and clothes and stuff. But they really liked their lifestyle, they liked how they grew their own stuff, they didn't have to pay for lots of things. They liked what they did for work. They enjoyed the way they lived and it was nice to get to live like that for a few days to see how other people live. This was my first trip with Build On. Um, my first time uh, helping to build a school. It wasn't my first time in Latin America, but I was struck by the poverty, um, by the 
lack of clean water, the lack of electricity. Um, you really came home grateful for everything we have here. They sent us pictures of the finished school and it looks it looks beautiful. It looks really it looks like a really amazing place compared to what they had before. It's a beautiful blue and white building with a roof, walls, door, apparently a, a bathroom. It's it's a much better environment to promote learning than uh, than what they had before. Yeah, I think that the new school is a big improvement. Well, I think it is important that we all saw this is how half the world lives. Um, and I don't think that's how most of us um, here in the States live and aren't familiar with that experience at all of not of having to walk to get your water, to walk to take a to bathe. Our follow-up, like I said, we, we want to get pictures to the families because they are eager to have the pictures as mementos of our visit. We, like I said, we're making the books and we're going to gather some school supplies and some items that we think would be particularly helpful to our host families. For instance, we noticed that if they had a flashlight that they could put on a headband that that would be leave their hands free to move around. I plan on following up with Build On as, as well as a couple other people that went on the trip. We're also talking about possibly going back there at a later date to go visit, visit the village on our own. So I think that'll be a great thing to do if we can possibly pull that off. I love to go back and to visit them again and to see how they're doing, you know, see, see the kids, see how the kids are growing and how the kids are improving from what we did for them from, from the school that we built for them. Um, see how the school's doing, see how our families are doing, um, just, just to see the, the impact that, that we made on their community after a while. In the future, I would plan to follow up with what we did, go to make another trip to Nicaragua because I had so much fun there and I would love to see my host family and the people of La Coyotera again because it was an experience and they like live with you forever in your heart. We do plan to go back to La Coya Terra in the future, particularly the adults. We would love to um, talk more with Marlon and see what he has been able to do at the school. Um, and we, like I said, we really connected with the village. Um, it was uh, at, when we left, some of us were crying, including myself. And so when you kind of put um, that sort of energy and that effort, um, you want to maintain a connection. I'm going off to college this year, but um, uh, it, you know, I know they do tr build on does trips for people in college, so I would love to, you know, maybe go back to the village and visit them again or to do an build another school. And if I can do that, I would certainly like to stay involved. I would like very much to go back uh, to Nicaragua um, to, to help see how the school is doing and to help teach about sanitation and hygiene. Uh, my desire with Build On is to stay extremely active. I'd like to continue it throughout my college career and hopefully later on in life as I can. Uh, I think it's an extremely positive experience and that every student should at least try to become active in some way. The TD students were uh, amazing with their energy and joyfulness, um, how much they helped play with the children, uh, how fully involved they got both with the community and in helping to build the school. I was really impressed.
lot of bugs there. Um, there were actually these really huge scorpion spiders in our family's house that scared us, me and Kike and Lindsay a lot because they were big and scary. And there was a scorpion on my bag once. The second morning, Sage woke up and found that he had a chicken under his bed. And he was freaking out and freaking out and he was screaming for them to come in and they took it out. So the last morning when we were leaving, the village leader and his son thought it would be a good idea to wake me up by sticking a chicken in the room under my bed. A minute later, the door opens and they threw the chicken in and it just starts running under my bed and squawking and squawking. And I'm like, who put the chicken under my bed? And you just see the village leader standing there laughing. He's like, good idea, it's good idea. Well, on one of the nights for the first time we had chicken and rice and we didn't know where the chicken came from and then my roommate Lindsay said, oh, that chicken was the chicken that was running around the house this morning. And it was really chewy, it wasn't like anything that I was used to, but really fresh, like the food was really good. You know, in all those cartoons, you see, oh, well, the, the rooster wakes you up in the morning at dawn. No, they wake you up at 2 o'clock in the morning and continue to wake you up until dawn. So that's not... That's not something that they made up. It's actually true, and it's worse. <laughs> I mean, it works. It does work. But yeah, they actually do that.